Welcome to the Maintenance Mavericks podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn all things about maintenance and reliability. I'm your host, Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Each episode, I'll be meeting with an expert within our community to take a deep dive into topic source from our maintenance community Slack group. Today, I'm super excited to have Larry Wigger here on the show. With over 20 years of management experience, Larry has gained a ton of knowledge about supply chain management activities, shares his expertise in his current role as the assistant teaching professor at UMKC's School of Management. Welcome to the podcast, Larry. I'm super excited to learn from you. Well, thanks for inviting me, Ryan. I've been looking forward to our discussion. Have you share a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you were first introduced into this like field of maintenance and reliability? I spent uh, 20 plus years in various management roles, everything from project management, general operations management, all the way up to founding partner, uh, equity partner in the uh, a large program management company that's grown to 500 plus employees and international offices. Much of that experience is what we call multi-site retail construction and branding, right? So building gas stations, banks, restaurants, hotels for global brands like BP, 7-Eleven, McDonald's, Starbucks, Walgreens, Marriott, et cetera. In those 20 plus, 23 years, however many it was exactly, uh, we're split pretty evenly between supply chain management roles and more general operations management. And now for the last six years, I've been sharing that experience in the classroom. So I teach a mix of courses to MBA students and business undergrads in supply chain management, operations management, uh, quality process improvement. I have a master's of science in supply chain and MBA, and I'm now a doctoral candidate in economics. All right. What a kind of like prime time for us to be talking especially given your expertise in supply chain. I think it is November 29th as the day that we are recording, almost December of 2021. And obviously, I'm sure you're well aware, everyone's well aware of some of the supply chain issues in the world going on right now. So I kind of want to ask you and kind of talk about this and how it relates to our industry. What happened with these unprecedented disruptions to our supply chain. Can you walk us through like kind of what happened and got us to where we are today? My research areas are in labor, money, and supply chains. And so those research areas mean I'm focusing on uh, what happened during COVID and and what follows it, what happens next? How do we weather that storm? So I think it's helpful to think about relatively recent history in those three areas. And so when I say relatively recent, I'm talking about decades, right? So We've been 50, 60, 70 years on a trend of outsourcing and offshoring our supply chains, beginning after World War II and encouraged by corporate uh, tax law policies for many strategic reasons, not just seeking uh, lower cost labor, you know, more lax regulatory environments, right? Less legal constraints, environmental protections that goes into why things are sometimes cheaper elsewhere. But they're also, it's always also attractive to us, has been for us to have a manufacturing presence offshore to gain access to those markets, right? So we get a cheaper source for the things we're making, but then we also gain the ability to sell those things into those countries. So the result of that has been a concentration of sourcing from Asia. So a lack of geodiversity, in our supply chains. And adding to that problem is a lack of real-time visibility. So you know, I'm sure upkeep in the software uh, business can understand the, um, the lack of uh, data transparency, the problems that creates in supply chains, not knowing exactly where your stuff is and when you can realistically expect it to arrive. Compounding these things uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so, we have heavily promoted four-year college degrees right? To the point of stigmatizing good, honest, blue collar trade labor, right? Things like uh, construction workers and truck drivers, factory workers, dock workers, warehouse workers. And as education rates of a population increases, birth rates fall, right? Women enter the workplace, people delay getting married, they delay starting a family, family sizes are smaller, and all those things add up to a smaller workforce, right? And eventually a population in decline. And we see the extreme end of that in Japan, I think, is the model we hold out. But America is following that trajectory and and Europe is as well. As uh, education rates go up, as the affluence of a society raises, the population growth slows and eventually goes into decline. So all that means fewer workers. And unfortunately, we stigmatized immigration here in the U.S., right? So we really need to embrace immigration, thoughtful, responsible uh, careful, but we should be welcoming uh, immigrant workers into our workforce because, you know, our population isn't growing on its own. So record low unemployment, you know, was our trend before COVID. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, the current popular press storylines of people leaving the workplace, right? People retiring, people getting fed up with the, the complications of working during COVID. But through all this, the U.S. remains a very large, affluent economy, right? Um, we are second uh, only to China in a couple of categories. But I mean, we are, you know, we are the economic engine of the world in some ways. And interest rates are historically low. So money's virtually free, right? U.S. consumer demand remains high. So all these things are working against each other. Housing prices going up, you know, in some markets, uh, 30% year on year, right? When mortgages are only 2 or 3%, ultimately the consumer is saying, well, I'll just borrow more, right? So again, you know, high demand, constrained labor force, a heavy reliance on offshore production in our supply chains. And then, uh, you know, and anything we're dealing with here in the U.S. and the movement of goods, right, the, whether it's the labor issues with truck drivers, whatever it is, it's worse in many of these foreign countries, right? Because we're sitting here happy with 60, 70, in some states, even 80 percent vaccination rates. And in a lot of those countries that are producing these things or whose border they're crossing, right, they're struggling to get 1% vaccination rate. So significant bottlenecks, very significant bottlenecks. Yeah, I think one other trend I would mention uh, is automation. And again, something I'm sure uh, you at Upkeep are very familiar with, but that was a trend ahead of time, right? Before before COVID, um, we'd been on a trend in automation, whether it was artificial intelligence or robotics or driverless vehicles or chatbots for help desks, right? All different kinds of versions of automation, but COVID coming through it and envisioning our future afterwards, you know, more and more firms are going to rely even more heavily on it. You know, when you struggle to find good people, regardless of the cost, right? You're willing to pay an inflated wage, but you just can't find the good people then automation becomes an attractive option. So I'll stop there, but I could, uh, I could, <laughs> I could ramble a bit. No, this is so interesting, Larry. And I, I'm personally learning so much from you. I'm going to ask a really difficult question and kind of ask you to predict the future from here. What happens next? I mean, we kind of talked about this supply chain issue, high demand, low labor force, a focus on robotics and automation. What do you think happens next as it relates to like, the labor workforce of our customers in our industry, you know, the blue collar worker. You know, as I said, the, the embracing immigration and getting our public policies right on immigration so we can do everything we can to bolster the, the workforce uh, is important. I think reimagining our, um, our workforce training, right? So whether it's two-year colleges, trade schools, union apprenticeships, those kind of things. One of the bright notes maybe uh, coming out of COVID, I think as a society, I think a lot of people have started to recognize and respect blue collar labor, right? You know, there's an appreciation for uh, that grocery store clerk who's, you know, stocking shelves or bagging groceries uh, for the, the Uber, the DoorDash driver who's bringing your, you know, uh, meal delivery, you know, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, right? The, all, all the delivery drivers and all that workforce. Um, I think there's some respect for it. I think there will be some tolerance for inflation, right? For increase in, in prices that we pay, recognizing that some of that's going to better wages for, for those people who are doing, a, you know, a critical, critical thing for us. Um, you know, I, I think automation, and it's not, automation isn't something we should be afraid of, because the reality is, we don't have enough people, right? And that's only going to get worse. Um, so being smart and thoughtful about what we automate and recognizing that we don't automate jobs. We don't replace a person with a robot. We automate specific tasks and activities or processes, yes. right? So, so once you recognize that, now over time, right, you accumulate all those tasks and activities as you redefine and reorganize jobs. And eventually it may mean you hire less workers. But right now, the problem is we don't have enough. The workforce is aging and retiring. So it's not so much a matter of firing somebody because you bought a robot, but the incremental addition of automation, automating tasks and activities so that as people retire, as they leave, you know, eventually you may not be able to need to replace as many of them. Yeah, we talk about that a ton as well. It's not about people getting replaced. It's by, to your point, it's tasks. And oftentimes the most, the first tasks to be automated away are going to be the most mundane, the lowest skill, and also the highest safety risk. 
you know, again, we don't want humans to be risking their lives and spending like the human creativity on if it's a, you know, high risk and, you know, mundane task. And then to second your point, you know, what we always talk about is like that flare stack inspection as like the perfect example of how, you know, flare stack inspectors, you have two people running up flare stack, running inspections. Now they're being replaced by a drone. But then what we always talk about is who's the person behind the drone? It's going to be someone who's piloting it, looking at all of the results, analyzing all of the data that comes from the, these drones. And ultimately it takes that high risk position, puts them in a place that really enables like human creativity and what, what humans do best. It's an interesting time rim because using that example, right? Typically when we see a big automation technology, right? Innovation come in and people get afraid about technologically driven unemployment. There's a temporal mismatch, right? You have this new technology you need and then suddenly you have this, this aging workforce that you no longer need. And it's not reasonable to think you're going to retrain them to do the new thing. We're sitting here, you know, trying to weather, weather this pandemic, and it puts us in a unique position where we're constrained right now on people to do the work. So training up the new workforce to do that new thing, do things in new ways, puts us in, you know, the position then to make that step change without disrupting the existing people, right? If we're already short 60,000 truck drivers, you know, adding driverless trucks to the fleets isn't taking anybody out of a job. So that, you know, it's an interesting, it's an opportunity for us here across a broad spectrum of the economy. Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's go back to that supply chain issue, just because mm -hmm. it's so like top of mind right now. What's kind of going on right now is we've got this intense like supply chain shortage. I we, uh, we live here in Los Angeles, California. The ports apparently are just absolutely packed. If we had a crystal ball and we could go back in time, what are some things that we could have done differently to prevent this supply chain issue from happening? You know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I hate to be that guy. You know, I, I would point at, uh, and I've alluded to some of them, but I, I would point at three probably primary things um, that we that we got wrong or we didn't do enough of or we didn't take seriously. And these are kind of like, what are the next steps, right? Beyond triaging, you know, the, the glut in the port that you saw, right? What are the things that we should be thinking about now strategically in right now for the immediate future? You know, there's three things, right? So strategic risk assessment of our supply chains. So focusing on geodiversity and inter-industry risk, right? Where, where do multiple industries rely on the same link in the supply chain? Um, and that geodiversity, right? I mean, just the basics of redundancy as a risk mitigation. The Navy SEALs like to say two is one and one is none. If it's mission critical and you have to have it and you take one, well, you're screwed if it fails, right? So you take two in case one fails. So redundancy. And so in our supply chains, right? Not sourcing everything from one continent as in Asia. And so thoughtfully strategizing and having, you know, credible supply from Asia, from Europe, from South America, from North America, you know, even if somebody went overboard and renationalized everything, right? We're equally screwed if the pandemic flares up here in North America. It's the redundancy that gives us strength. So Strategic risk assessment, focusing on the geodiversity, a step change in supply chain transparency, right? So we have whole new suites of technology with Internet of Things, smart devices, with blockchain to securely, you know, share information in a decentralized fashion, 5G, all kinds of wireless technology, um, whether it's uh, electronic locks on shipping containers or telemetry information on ships as they move, you know, rails, intermodal containers, all communicating seamlessly. Um, there's a whole new level of technology that we could apply as a, a, you know, with an infrastructure mentality as we prepare for, you know, improvements. Um, so supply chain transparency. Yeah. And then we already talked some about it, but the workforce development, yeah. right? So as we pursue policies to de-risk through strategic reshoring, right, of, of chunks of our, you know, like we're doing with the, with the semiconductor factories, right? So we used to have a deep depth in um, semiconductor electronic manufacturing down in the Southwest in, in Arizona. And so, you know, for 
over a year now, probably, we've been heavily focused on bringing back some of that production of microchips that have proved so critical to a lot of components, a lot of finished goods, a lot of products, you know, cars, trucks, et cetera, so that we have diversity, right? So all our eggs aren't in the basket of Taiwan, right? So that we have multiple sources. But as we do that, how do we develop the workforce, right? So, and as a society, getting comfortable with that idea, that every parent doesn't need to encourage their kid to go get a, a four-year college degree when that student probably has no idea what they want to do with it. And here I am teaching, right, you know, at a college <laughs> level, but I caution heavily against just sending your kid to college because they don't know what they want to do, right? It turns into high school 2.0 at that point. So, <laughs> so trade schools, two-year colleges, uh, bringing some hands-on uh, practical, applicable work type training back into high schools, right? The, you know, the old fashioned shop classes, but with an update, you know, coding, et cetera. So, so what I hear for, from you, Larry, is like two big things. One is diversity, diversity and talent skills, you know, education, you know, that that's going to help make us much more robust as an entire country nation. And the second thing that I heard was redundancy, redundancies. So there's no single points of failure. And I'm going to make a wild guess. I don't have a PhD in supply chain um, and, and economics, but my, my guess is the reason why we got here is because we're all racing to you know, ship and sell the lowest cost good. And obviously re redundancy actually has a cost to it. I mean, we work in maintenance reliability in order to have a redundant part on hand so that when something goes down, we have we can you know, spin that back up in a matter of minutes versus days and hours. That actually has a cost. And my guess is that we got to this point to where we are because you know, we've just been so focused, hyper-focused on building, shipping, selling the lowest cost good. There's a lot of truth to that. Part of the interesting thing, if you think about the time period this unfolded on, right? And it really is some of that. When you think about the decisions that led us down this road were made 70 years ago right? In, in Asia following World War II. And anytime you build a manufacturing base and you, you concentrate and say, I want to make this type of thing here, well, all the supply chains that support it develop around it, right? And the workforce and the training of the workforce, right? So, so as we concentrated uh, manufacturing for cost reasons, largely, of, of electronics, consumer electronics, TVs, radios, appliances, maybe, um, in Asia after World War II, and then automobiles eventually as well, right? As we, to self-realizing uh, momentum that you get on at some point, I don't know where I was going with that thought. Absolutely. And there's so many contributing factors mm -hmm. to what got us to where we are today. And obviously yeah. hindsight is 2020. but Lair, I've learned so much from you. It's been such a good discussion. Uh, we have a segment here on the show at the very end of our episode, we do a quick fire set of questions. I, you know, ask you a question, get your response in 20 seconds or less. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the 20 seconds or less, but <laughs> let's give it a shot. Let's jump in. Chris, I would love to know what's a piece of technology that you're most excited about, or you think will leave a, you know, lasting impact on our industry. I think a piece of tech, I, I would, I would probably start with blockchain. Right. So thinking about the need for some for for data transparency, right, to improve things, something that would have made a difference if we'd had it during COVID. So to foster collaboration along the supply chain and with with central planners, right, FEMA, Department of Defense, the UN, whoever, right, uh, to be able to get a look into our supply chains in a credible, auditable, secure way that doesn't disclose competitive information, but can still allow us to stress test our supply chains, right? We can run scenarios where we can really understand where we're at risk. So I think blockchain as, as one technology, but linked up with many others would be that's, one thing I would point out. That's super interesting. Yeah, I, I've never really thought about blockchain application in supply chain, but it, it actually does make a ton of sense. I would point at, uh, you know, if, if your listeners are interested, there's a company called the Provenance Chain Network. I think their website may be the Provenance Chain. That's their deal is using blockchain to allow big global brands to give their consumers full competence in the chain of custody of goods. So you walk into a grocery store, you know, that salmon was wild caught and where and it was never frozen. Or, or you buy a, a cup of coffee and you know what percentage of that five bucks 
the guy who grew the coffee beans got. The wood and a piece of furniture was sustainably harvested, et cetera, et cetera. Again, driven by the brands who want to protect their products and provide their consumers that value. All right, Larry, what's your uh, favorite memory of the biggest win you've had in the maintenance reliability operations space? Specific to maintenance and reliability, I would, Ryan, I think I would point at some time that I spent to kind of do a part of a company I used to work for uh, doing large-scale residential housing. And so those contracts were on a 50-year leaseback position. So instead of uh, Congress writing a big check building houses and the military maintained them. Instead, we were given uh, the land and the houses and had to provide a competitive market price product that the troops would rent then. But it, it put us in the position of saying, what's the, what's the best value for everybody involved in a 50 year position, right? It's not, we're not a landlord, a real estate developer building an apartment that we want to, you know, get out of in 10 years, right? Or we're not somebody trying to flip a property, but it's taking that total cost of ownership and thinking about the maintenance, the energy consumption and everything else involved. So that's, that's awesome. relative to maintenance and reliability. That would probably be it. All right. Biggest mistake you've learned a ton from within your career? <laughs> There's a lot of them. I mean, one that comes to mind is uh, ink the contract fast. Once you've reached an agreement, once you know, once you reach an agreement, fully land it. Because if you don't execute it right away, if you begin work without that contract executed, the negotiation will reopen and it's going to cost you money. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and last question for, for me, Larry, is uh, what's the best piece of career advice that you've ever been given? I would say um, somebody once told me very, very early on in, in my career, before I was even out of college, but the more you know, the more you're worth. And I think, um, you know, I marry that with never stop learning. And, and that includes work. So get your hands dirty early, often, and it starts there in the workplace and then pursue the education that interests you. And you're going to learn more by working as you study. They're, they're kind of force multipliers against each other, right? As you work, as you study and learn, uh, you'll synthesize all that together. So the more you know, the more you're worth. That's awesome. Larry, thank you so much for going through those quick fire set of questions with me. Lastly, can you share with our listeners all the different ways that they can connect with you, follow you on your journey. Probably the easiest would be to find me on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. It's Larry Wigger, L-A-R-R-Y dot W-I-G-G-E-R. Uh, you should be able to find me on LinkedIn. I'm at the University of Missouri in Kansas City uh, as a professor, or you can email me, WiggerL at U-M-K-C dot E-D-U. All right. Thank you so much again, Larry, for joining us. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to today's episode of the Maintenance Community Podcast. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. You can also connect with me. I'm super active on LinkedIn. You can find me and Larry within our maintenance community Slack group. You can feel free to ask us any follow-up questions from today's episode, suggest any future topics. You can sign up at upkeep.org. I hope to connect with all of you soon. Thank you again, Larry. Until next time. Take care.